All right, so um, we'll talk about pain medications here. We'll talk a little bit next time we meet about some specific areas we use pain management. You know, pain management has a lot of applications, so post-surgical pain, acute pain for like, you know, an acute injury somebody might have, and then of course there's chronic types of pain like chemotherapy related, um, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. So we'll talk about some of those uh, more specific diseases next week. But I want to spend some time just talking about pain medications generally because Really, I mean, any person that gets admitted to the hospital is going to have standard orders for pain management. Any person that probably comes into your clinic, uh, the odds of them having pain at some point, being a regular patient of yours, probably good. You know, they might come to you, maybe they sprained their ankle or broke their arm and the, the ER gave them 10 Percocet and they want a few more. So just to, times to think about things like that um, and go through your pain options here. So, um, but first, we can do a little bone mineral review here if you guys want to dust off your thinking caps. Now, if you didn't go through the lecture, you're going to have no idea what this is talking about. So there's that. But I'll just go through it quick, and then, of course, you can look back and review it. Um, so I've got an 82-year-old male. He's got osteoporosis. I uh, started on a leather day, which is brain class in X six months ago. He plays a significant reflux. I uh, confess that he's not taking medication with food, and he forgets to do so beforehand. Uh, this is something I'm going to down, down a bit before his breakfast. And uh, past clinic notes shows he does have a history of various compliance issues. So which of the following options might be better for him? So for those of you that watched the lecture already, is there one of those that sticks out? C. C. Good. Good job. Okay. And C is what? what what's the difference between it and the other ones? IV. It's an IV only once a year infusion. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great candidate for that drug. So good job. And of course, I pretty much gave you everything you could imagine as far as pork compliance. So you want to take it on an empty stomach 30 minutes before first food, drink, except for water, or um, other medications as well. And then uh, don't lay down, of course, before, after taking it. Okay. And you probably got that from all the commercials for these medications too, right? If you've seen them anytime soon. All right, so uh, for the Big Lebowski fans, I've got a funny meme here. If you don't know what the Big Lebowski is or haven't seen it, please, I'm not trying to promote gun violence or be offensive with this. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, the, so pain is a very complicated topic, and it's something that is really controversial as far as how we're treating it, um, what we're doing in, in our country versus other areas, and there's a whole lot of um, legal stipulations around prescribing, especially when we're talking about the opioid pain medications, of course. The rest of the stuff, not a lot of controversy around that, but unfortunately, opioids work quite well for pain, um, and especially for acute, like, high pain, um, post-surgicals and injuries, opioids are our go-to medication. So we'll spend a good deal of time on those today. But this is the World Health Organization's approach to managing pain, and uh, it's fairly intuitive. You basically start with your non-opioid therapies and move up from there, um, depending on how severe the pain is. So somebody who's got really severe pain, it's probably not worth trying an oral dose of Tylenol, depending on what the pain is. You know, it depends on what you think. You can always give it a shot. There are some people who um, will be on the opposite end of the spectrum of what you might expect, where they, they refuse opioids. They're like, I'm not going to take any morphine or codeine or whatever you're going to try and give me. Give me anything else, but I won't take those. So then you're stuck with those options. Uh, but there's plenty of other patients who will say that they're, you know, don't tolerate certain things, and then you get into a whole lot of question marks on whether they actually have pain or not. That's all other topic. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, putting opioids to the back end or as far as along as you can is generally the the strategy with any type of pain management. But um, so let's talk. Start at the bottom of the ladder and talk about NSAIDs first. Um, whoops, I think I went I went too far in here. Okay, so NSAIDs, uh, there's about 17 million Americans estimated to take an NSAID on a daily basis, and probably more than that. Uh, they're super common worldwide. In fact, Europe uses NSAIDs a lot more heavily than we do. Uh, well, we use them a lot, but they use them much more so in place of opioid therapy. They're a lot more hesitant to prescribe opioids, whereas we kind of have embraced the opioid um, <laughs> as, a, as a pain management alternative. Uh, but anyway, they're used all over the world. Um, and you know, as a as a group of our population, the baby boomer generation shifts to elderly. People are living longer, although I guess the most recent study says people aren't living quite as long, but still pretty long, comparatively speaking. We're having a lot more people with just long-term degenerative issues like joint disorders and um, osteoarthritis really catching up with people, which is causing people to seek more pain solutions for um, chronic pain. Uh, and it's really just an, it, an association with age for a lot of these patients. We'll talk about osteoarthritis. Um, during the next lecture. But the point is that you're going to see more people needing pain uh, management. And NSAIDs 
play a big role in that. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> um, so historically, NSAID started with the salicylate family, which is basically aspirin. Um, and they were used exclusively until the 50s. Um, the first attempts to make a non-salicylate NSAID were toxic. But indomethacin was the first one to come on the market kind of in the late 50s. Indomethacin is actually used today in a lot of OB indications using indomethacin. We'll talk about that more with OB, and I'll mention it very briefly today, but it's not really common to use outside of OB indication. But it is a, an old drug that's still around today. So we have 20 different enzymes on the market, six different pharmacologic categories, which doesn't really matter. They all have the same mechanism of action, so whatever pharmacologic category it is, it's kind of irrelevant. It's just a point to discuss. Um, variable kinetics, dosing, and frequency. So some of them are long-acting, some of them have variable um, uh, affinity for different COX enzymes. We'll talk about the COX inhibition pathway here in a second where you do that. Um, SIP interaction is minimal and minimal first-pass metabolism, so they really don't have a lot of liver enzyme interaction issues, which is really great for somebody who's taking a chronic medication. Uh, Short-acting NSAIDs are listed in this category, so uh, drugs like ibuprofen and ketorolac, diclofenac might be some of the more common ones, and the long-acting ones like naproxen, um, celecoxib, um, meloxicam, some of the more common long-acting medications. Patients will have really variable response to these in theory. Uh, we'll talk about some of the debate between the efficacy of NSAIDs and which ones are really more effective than others. And toxicity could vary a lot too. So patients might get a GI bleed on one and not at all on the other. And I'll show you some of the data behind uh, those here. But first we'll talk about the mechanism of action. So let's just review a little bit of anti-inflammatory processes in the body or how to create anti-inflammatory processes, I should say. So arachidonic acid is our icosanoid pre precursor, and icosanoids are the family of inflammatory immune messengers. So what happens is your tissue gets damaged somehow, arachidonic acid is released uh, due to this damage, and then uh, uh, that triggers a downstream effect to cause cyclooxygenase to um, release and cause the up production of the following mediators, so prostaglandins, prostacyclins, which are primarily our pain mediators in the thromboxane leukotriene, which have other effects. So this just uh, diagram I showed you this last fall, but just to review it. So our COX inhibitors are NSAIDs, so that's what they're inhibiting is COX-1 or COX-2, and that's going to decrease the ability to produce prostacyclins, prostaglandins, and also thromboxane. So we'll talk about um, the difference between aspirin, because aspirin works a bit upstream too. It decreases the ability of arach arachidonic acid to really have this effect. Um, and it causes, we use aspirin mostly for platelet inhibition, right? But, um, do, so the question is, do regular NSAIDs cause uh, bleeding risk via platelets? And we'll talk about that and how they work with aspirin and can you take both at the same time and all those questions in a minute. But the point is, is that you're decreasing Cox's ability to um, have any effect from that arachidonic acid up release. Therefore, you can't get those inflammatory mediators to be released as frequently. All right. So COX-1, uh, just to review this again, COX-1 is our constantly active cyclooxygenase enzyme. It's responsible for housekeeping prostaglandins that protect cells primarily in the GI tract. And then COX-2 is inducible. So this is the one that's going to be a, a he more heavily upregulated enzyme during uh, some sort of a tissue injury stimulus. And that's going to cause your inflammatory and also some cancer-related prostaglandins, which isn't quite as relevant to this lecture, but uh, just to mention that. Um, and that's, again, a general concept of NSAIDs. So when we're going to talk about GI bleeding risk, remember that COX-1 inhibition is going to be part of every single NSAID on the market with the exception of one, which is celecoxib, which we'll talk about at the end. But the point is, is that um, they're all going to have somewhat of a risk of causing that um, decrease of housekeeping prostaglandins, and therefore you lose some of that cytoprotection in the GI tract, and therefore you put yourself at risk for a GI bleed taking an NSAID. This is a bit of an incomplete chart, but it was one of the better ones I could find without doing a lot of research and making my own. So why read that's real when you don't have to, right? Uh, so uh, non-selective COX-2 enzymes. So these, these enzymes are going to affect both COX-1 and COX-2. Um, remember to get pain management, you have to affect COX-2. So basically your enzymes fall into probably three categories, which is COX-2 selective, some COX-2 activity, and not COX-2 selective at all, meaning they have about equal affinity for COX-1 and 2. So your standard NSAIDs, the ones that are probably the most commonly used, are not selective, like ibuprofen, naproxen, ketorolac, probably the three most commonly used NSAIDs uh, don't have any selectivity. Uh, that doesn't mean that they have all really heavy risk of causing GI, so I'll show you some data on that here in a second. 
Um, so some Cox 2 activity uh, means that it's a little bit, and the way they worded that is wrong. I think I'd rather say it like uh, more Cox, more heavily Cox 2 versus Cox 1. So it's going to lean a little bit more heavily Cox 2. So the, the theory behind that is that you inhibit Cox 2 to a more um, a higher degree, which would give you better pain management, theoretically, and less risk for GI bleed. Now, in practice, fortunately, it doesn't really work out that way. Uh, now, if you make a drug that's purely selective for COX-2, like celecoxib, um, meloxicam is listed on here in etotalac. However, those aren't actually COX-2 selective. Uh, they're very heavily COX-2 selective, but they do have some COX-1 inhibition. So the point is, is that the only COX-2 pure selective agent is celecoxib on the U.S. market. What are these other ones down here, these other ICSIPs? They don't matter because they aren't on, on the market or they're only available in other countries. So the only one in the U.S. is celecoxib. All right, so our safety concerns. We talked about the renal toxicity of NSAIDs and the mechanism behind that. So of course you're at risk for acute kidney injury with an NSAID. And remember that people who have relatively healthy functioning kidneys, who are well hydrated, very low risk for any renal toxicity with an NSAID. It's really when you get that perfect storm uh, maybe an ACE inhibitor on board, plus dehydration, plus your NSAID, that's when you run into that risk primarily. So for the most part, yes, renal toxicity is a concern, not a big one. It's only one we really think about um, when somebody might come in with acute kidney injury. We're like, okay, that's a patient we aren't going to give any NSAIDs to until that resolves. Or patients who um, are kind of creeping up on the CKD spectrum, to the point where they're looking at late-stage CKD, we probably want to pull those NSAIDs off at a certain cutoff. Like our hospital cuts people off when they're at creatinine clearance less than 40 mils per minute. So that's, you know, a normal person would be above 60. C advanced CKD is usually below 30, so it's kind of somewhere in the middle there where we'd say, okay, we're not giving that sense anymore. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of people can take these. And one interesting thing to remember, if somebody's on dialysis, uh, they can take as many answers as they want. Why? Because you're not going to kill their kidneys. But, but it's not an elimination issue. It's that uh, vasoconstrictive property that it has or decreasing the ability of your kidneys to vasodilate in the right place is more, more appropriate, I guess. But the point is that if your kidneys are already completely shot and you're getting dialyzed, it doesn't matter. You can take NSAIDs. Um, okay, so pregnancy. Uh, for the most part, NSAIDs are contraindicated during pregnancy. We'll talk about pain in pregnancy uh, during the OB lecture, so we'll go through that in a little more detail, like pregnancy cat categorization, those types of things. So don't worry too much about that right now. Uh, but for the most part, we don't give NSAIDs to pregnant people. GI bleeding is the big concern here. So these uh, are a couple studies, and I put the references down here in case you want to read them. Uh, this first one was from uh, British Medical Journal. This is a rheumatology journal. NSAID data is kind of interesting because it usually comes from a couple different subsets of data collection areas, I guess you could think about it. Uh, one is rheumatology, which is very different from your person taking it for like osteoarthritis pain. Um, and the other one is a lot of dental procedures. Dentists and dental research has a lot of NSAID literature published. So we rely on that, we extrapolate that to a lot of like post-surgical things too. So that's more of like our acute pain. So it's interesting that we don't really study NSAIDs a lot in the patient populations that probably use it almost the most. And um, not that those patient populations are important, but it's just kind of an interesting sidebar. Anyway. Um, this shows you the relative incidence of GI bleeding, comparatively speaking, to which NSAID. And you can see that both studies show, well, ignore celecoxib and this other toxin here, but both studies show ibuprofen actually on the low end of the spectrum here. So ibuprofen has um, been proven fairly frequently in these studies to be the safest NSAID when it comes to GI bleeding, which it should be relieving because people can buy this over the counter and you can you know, take as much as you want without physician supervision, and no one's really telling you how much to take. And the bottle tells you how much, but that doesn't mean somebody's going to not overdo it. Uh, but the, the good news is, is that you're at lower risk for GI bleeding. Now, it's kind of relative to a lot of this. So the question is, you know, what else is there here? Like naproxen or a lead, kind of in the middle. Where do they have naproxen? Similarly in the middle here. The one other thing, they don't have ketorolac up here, but ketorolac is widely considered to be the highest risk for GI bleeding out of the NSAIDs. We'll talk about Ketorolac and all its majesty here in a few minutes. There's a lot of controversy around that drug. So what happens when somebody has a GI bleed on NSAID? Well, again, you're, you have some sort of decrease in um, prostaglandin, housekeeping prostaglandins. And if you have uh, exposed mucosal gel layer, which could possibly be disrupted by, by acidity, or other things uh, potentially, um, like if somebody has uh, um, H. pylori or something like that, NSAIDs can easily cause a disruption in that further, and you can get a compounded effect or you get a GI bleed. 
Um, for the most part, this is rare for somebody just taking NSAIDs for uh, as needed indication, but you do see it more commonly for somebody on continuous NSAID. If you think about taking it around the clock, you're putting yourself at higher risk. You have no housekeeping costs to that, or much less than somebody not taking it as frequently. Um, and then that's going to put you at more risk for uh, damage to the GI tract. Uh, the H plus is being hydrogen ion, so it's an acidic environment. Acidity contributes to the tissue damage. So risk factors, um, things we watch out for, patients who are over 65 are at higher risk. Uh, patients with diminished renal function tend to be at higher risk. Uh, if you have a prior ulcer or GI bleeding history, you're at risk. Um, any type of antiplatelet or anticoagulant, of course, would put you at risk for that too. It's not an absolute contraindication to avoid NSAIDs while somebody's on an anticoagulant. It is a consideration. A lot of people, a lot of providers will recommend their patients not take the drugs at all while they're on, which can be really problematic if you have a patient who's relying on it for osteoarthritis and they have to take an anticoagulant. Like, what do you do? Because there's not a lot of other things that don't work that aren't narcotics. Uh, okay, chronic usage versus PRN usage. Again, chronic patient users are going to be at much higher risk than somebody taking it once a week for a headache or whatever. Uh, prevention, limit use uh, overall, so lean towards PRN if you can, um, and then uh, lean towards a COX-2 selected N1. And then also another good preventative measure is to take something that's going to inhibit acid production, so like a proton pump inhibitor like Prolisec and Nexium. Uh, we'll talk, get to those during the GI lecture, but those would be indicated for somebody. Yeah, generally speaking, it's probably a safe bet. If anybody's on chronic NSAID therapy, they should be taking um, uh, a proton pump inhibitor for sure. Okay, just making sure my thing's still recording here. Okay, uh, so drug interactions, lithium we'll talk about during bipolar. Um, lithium is cleared through the kidneys, and NSAIDs can interfere with the renal clearance of lithium, meaning that people can get toxic on it very quickly. So it's a very small subset of population. If you work in mental health, and in high acuity mental health, I should say, you might be dealing with patients on lithium, otherwise it's not real common. Um, antihypertensive, we talked about the um, NSAID with uh, lisinopril or, or um, ACE inhibitor interaction quite significantly. And then doubling up. So the problem is people don't know that they're on the same drugs in the same class. So they might buy Aleve and ibuprofen and take them together and not realize what they're doing. And that does compound the issue. So it's not like your body maxes out. It just You end up with an overdose of NSAIDs. Usually patients don't get any more pain benefit from taking extra NSAIDs. They simply put themselves at high risk for side effects. Uh, and that also goes for any prescribed NSAIDs. If you prescribe a patient an NSAID, make sure you're not telling them not to take additional over-the-counter ibuprofen or naproxen, those two being the over-the-counter available NSAIDs. Yeah? If taking food with an NSAID, that, I mean, my mom has grown up always told us to take Yes, yeah. Because I'll repeat the question for the recording. Taking food with an NSAID, yes, I would agree that that's a good idea. Um, food and a lot of water, too. Um, I recommend, like, a full, just a one big glass of water is, is a good enough. Because sometimes I've you run into people with issues who have gotten it, like, um, like a big ibuprofen tablet. Have you ever seen like the 800 milligram ibuprofen tablets? They're really big. You look at those like lodged in their throat or something. They can actually get some local exposure to anti-inflammatory effects that are negative, and, and so decreasing the, the prostaglandins that we want there and end up with uh, damage in the upper GI tract too. So um, yeah, lots of water and food is definitely a good idea. That's a good point. It's kind of a good rule of thumb for a lot of things that cause GI problems is to try taking them. Okay, so talking about moving away from GI bleeding and talking about um, some other risks with NSAIDs. There's a lot of controversy about NSAIDs with CV risk. So you might read articles about this or opinion pieces on this. I'm going to try and streamline basically what's out there. So the idea is that COX2, more COX2 selective NSAIDs are thought to have um, increased inflammatory bowel complications by decreased prostacyclin production, which can propose uh, predispose you to uh, vascular endothelial injury. You may have effects on endothelial cell and nitric oxide production too. The mechanism is not well understood, but it's thought that because of its ability to decrease inflammatory mediators, it also might have some issues with uh, decreasing your body's natural vasodilators as well. And that's where they think that people have some inherent CV risk by taking NSAIDs. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. I've got another slide on this too, so hold your horses for just a second. Um, Viox and Celebrex, or Rofacoxib and Celecoxib, were the two drugs on the market forever. Viox was removed from the market a few years ago. Um, it was associated with a twofold increased risk of general CV events. These are like MIs, um, heart failure development, stuff like that. Very general pool of cardiovascular events. 
this was removed from the market. Uh, and then Celebrex, which is a very similar drug, still on the market. It didn't have that same increase in risk. It was studied, um, but thought to still pose risk. So at some of the higher doses, it did show a significant risk. So the dosing's kept pretty low, but uh, it is still on the market. I do think that for most people who have high CV risk, the drug should be avoided at, at all costs, but um, that's a pretty standard recommendation for these uh, medications in general. Uh, so COX-2 selected carry the highest risk, but remember I said all NSAIDs inhibit some COX-2, so don't they all have some risk? Yes, so this is where the controversy comes in. Um, so if you have a patient who's on an NSAID chronically and they have some underlying cardiovascular disease, whether they've had an MI in the past, uh, whether they're a new heart failure patient, the question is what do you do? Do you keep them on their NSAID? Generally, no. You'd probably try and transition them. The first thing you'd want to try is switching them to Tylenol or acetaminophen, which we'll talk about in a second doesn't have cardiovascular risk, but a lot of patients don't get a good pain response from that. However, it is worth a try. Um, and then beyond that, you'd have to get a little more creative with your pain management strategy. The other thing is, is just say, well, this works really well for this patient. I don't believe in all this CV risk, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it's okay. Um, so what's been studied, naproxen is thought to have a lowest risk. Um, and at higher doses, naproxen does have a bit of a sustained antiplatelet effect, which can be a benefit for a patient who's post-MI. Uh, but theoretically, they all have the same warnings about these uh, increase in thromboembolic complications that's potentially going to cause it. So what exactly was this people at risk for? Um, increased chance of MI, stroke, heart failure, AFib, and cardiovascular death. So pretty much, again, a big bucket of cardiovascular-related concerns. Um, small risk, again, uh, so the, the risk for people who are taking this, pretty low, one to two per hundred per thousand person year, excuse me, um, and especially with uh, people who have low CV risk, there's virtually no risk whatsoever. So people who are using short-term therapy um, as needed medications, there's virtually no risk in giving uh, an NSAID to those patients. It's people with high CV risk, so people who already have some of these conditions that you want to be a little bit more careful with just because the data does show that they are at a higher incidence of getting some of those complications. So. Again, yeah, it is kind of a controversial thing, and the data is still coming in. There's more and more studies being done to look at this. Uh, but generally, again, we avoid them in those patients. We avoid them in heart failure patients for the most part. Uh, and um, also heart failure patients are going to be on ACE inhibitors primarily, right? So that, that's another interaction to avoid. And for somebody with just general hypertension, you can probably use them. Just be careful with what they're on. So if they're on an ACE inhibitor and ARB, that might not be the best idea. But if they're on like amlodipine, maybe it's fine. Okay. So I remember I mentioned about aspirin inhibiting platelets and NSAIDs kind of doing something similar along the same pathway. Well, what's the difference? Um, so the mechanism of interaction, actually NSAIDs do interfere a little bit with the antiplatelet activity because they um, compete with aspirin for a binding site on COX-1. So NSAIDs generally don't have a very sustained antiplatelet effect with the exception of naproxen. Um, but naproxen is pretty minimal compared to aspirin. So it competes for aspirin for a binding site on COX-1. Uh, and then it prevents the irreversible reaction that inhibits COX-1 for the remaining life of the platelet, like what aspirin would do. So basically it can prevent aspirin from working. Um, drugs like celecoxib or diclofenac have not been seen to do that, so those could be potentially NSAIDs we might consider using. And then um, the non-selected NSAIDs, ibuprofen and naproxen, shown to interfere. The question is naproxen has lower risk due to it having its own ability to have some antiplatelet effect. But again, this gets really muddy and confusing. So I think the thing to remember is that NSAIDs generally can interfere with aspirin. So what do we do? Um, they're basically contraindicated for anyone who absolutely requires uh, antiplatelet therapy. So people post cabbage, I would say I'd avoid them pretty much in people post MI in general who are on dual platelet, dual antiplatelet therapy, just because you don't want to have somebody get re-embolized and have to come back into your cath lab and have another heart attack. So okay. A uh, little joke, don't always take NSAIDs, but when I do, I take the whole bottle and get a GI uh, Just a joke to reinforce that NSAIDs have an dose, interesting dose-related response. So NSAIDs are theorized to have a ceiling effect. Um, you can basically only get so much analgesia out of an NSAID, which is very different than a drug like an opioid. So opioid drugs, you can basically push the dose as high as you want. Ultimately, if you try that, you're going to end up you know, if you want to look at it morbidly, you'll eventually kill somebody doing that because they can't tolerate that much opioid. However, they will get analgesia until they die. Um, with an NSAID, it's not the case. So eventually, you're just going to get a ceiling, uh, hit a ceiling with the dose. Now, what the ceiling is is a little bit debatable, and I'd say the evidence is, I think, a little iffy on this. However, 
It's widely believed that there's two different sealing doses for NSAIDs. There's an analgesic dose and an anti-inflammatory dose. So this is where it comes back to the literature. When we have rheumatoid arthritis, they're primarily looking at wanting NSAIDs on board, not really for analgesia, that's great, but they want the anti-inflammatory effects. And they're looking at higher doses. So for example, ibuprofen. <clears throat> Remember, ibuprofen's over the counter. It comes as a 200 milligram tablet. You can also get prescription strengths at higher doses. But um, 800 milligrams is considered the ceiling for a single dose for inflammation. 400 milligrams is considered a single dose for pain. So you can see where this gets a little muddy. We're like, well, what if inflammation is contributing to the pain? And what if I want to suppress the inflammation and help the pain? What dose do I use? You know, do people follow this? No, people give like six to 800 of ibuprofen all the time just for pain. So I don't think a lot of people, I would say anecdotally, believe in this. However, there is literature to support that there are ceiling doses. There's a lot of studies out there that look at comparing pain scores and people getting 400 and 800 of ibuprofen with no difference whatsoever. So the idea is that you, if you give 400 of ibuprofen, you're going to get the same analgesic effect with less of, uh, risk for side effects uh, than if you give 800, you're really not getting any additional pain benefits. So, yeah, that's kind of controversial, and as you go out in the rotations and meet providers, they may not look at you crazy, but there is a literature that there's a quite a few small, not the best design studies, but there are a few studies out there that support this. And again, how important is this? It's a good question. There's no long-term data really to show that one thing's better than the other. So it, it, it might be a little bit of a wash in the long run, but I think that there is something to be said here that we possibly use NSAIDs a little bit more aggressively than we should. And if we decrease our aggressive nature, maybe we'll avoid GI bleeding more frequently in the future. I don't know. It's just a theory. Okay. So moving on to different kinds of NSAIDs. Uh, let's start with salicylate. So let's start with the the beginning uh, uh, old school NSAID staff. So salicylate or aspirin related drugs technically aren't NSAIDs, but they kind of are because they have work in the same pathway. And we really just use aspirin for its anti platelet effects. So for from pain management, which is what we're talking about during this module, not really a big deal, mostly because people can't tolerate taking high doses of aspirin. If you take a lot of aspirin for its anti inflammatory or analgesic effects, you end up with um, a lot of dyspepsia because people don't people just don't tolerate it very well with those high doses, uh, so we don't use it. There is a drug called salicylate, which is um, kind of forgotten about. It's a TID or BID medication. Uh, it's not as risky from a GI bleeding perspective as a full NSAID. It's also proven to be not quite as effective. However, if you have a patient who can't take an NSAID because of GI bleed history or something like that, and you have a patient who um, is able to tolerate this without a significant amount of dyspepsia. It doesn't seem to have the same effects as a drug like aspirin. That could be a potential option for them. Is that over the counter? No, it's a prescription drug. Yeah. Do you know how much aspirin you have to take for a pain effect? Yeah, it's usually, I want to say it's at least 600 or 600 to 1,000 per dose. So you're looking at, you know, two or three full strength aspirins is what. Is recommended if you look at like osteoarthritis dose, but it's pretty significant compared to like anti platelet dose. I rarely ever see anyone on aspirin for pain, and if I do, they aren't taking a dose that really would work for pain. You know, it's like an older person who's like, oh yeah, I take that for my osteoarthritis, and they take like a baby aspirin once a day in the morning. I'm like, well, I don't know. That's a <laughs> don't kill somebody's placebo effect. You know, it's probably pretty harmless in the long run. Um, although some they might bleed out, so that's not good. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> We already talked about aspirin, so let's move on. Um, the acetaminophen, okay, so Tylenol is the most common pain medication on the planet. It's not really a, an NSAID at all. Um, it kind of is, though, so it doesn't really fit into another category. It's its own thing. Uh, and interestingly enough, no one really knows exactly the, the mechanism of Tylenol. We think we would, but we don't. Uh, there's some theory that it has anti-inflammatory effects within the central nervous system. It's pretty decent antipyretic. Um, there's thought that there might be other COX enzymes beyond one and two that it it's selectively, but um, again, we don't really know exactly how aspirin works, or um, acetaminophen works, excuse me. You might hear acetaminophen called paracetamol, that's a British term or a, a European term, um, or commonly abbreviated as APAP. It's a good abbreviation just to know if you see it on something. Uh, a lot of pharmacies used to use APAP as an abbreviation on pill bottles. We've gotten away from that because people don't know what that means, obviously. Um, so what do you dose for Tylenol? Tylenol dosing is uh, 325 to 1,000 milligrams every four to six hours as needed. Um, so it's really got a decent range to it. It's the 325 milligrams, what people will say, is the uh, over-the-counter strength that's regular Tylenol. And then the max, and then the extra strength Tylenol is a 500 milligram tablet. So that's the difference there. 
Um, the max is four grams a day, so I don't care if you know how to dose Tylenol, uh, but I do want you to know what the max dose is. So there will be an exam question that asks you what's the max dose of Tylenol in a more clinical case scenario way. So remember, four grams per day. It's really, really important, especially if you do any, well, really for anything. I can't think of a situation where it's not important because you people take Tylenol a lot. It's a really common thing in everybody's medication cabinet. People associate it as being a relatively safe medication, which it is for the most part. Um, but if you overdo it, you can end up with some severe liver issues. And you really don't want to make have people doing that a lot. So if you prescribe somebody like a combination product, for acute pain, for example, like a Percocet or a Norco, which we'll talk about in a second, like with a narcotic plus Tylenol, and then they go home and they take that, and they're taking um, you know, a gram of Tylenol every four hours on top of that, that's a bad situation to be in. Um, and if no one tells them, they might not understand that. You know, it says all over the label, don't take with other acetaminophen products, but do people always read everything we give them? Absolutely not, uh, unfortunately. So um, Tylenol, as far as efficacy goes, semi-effective. Um, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, when looked at head-to-head -head in studies, always beat Tylenol. I've never seen a, a Tylenol study come and say, hey, we're, we're more effective at pain management than ibuprofen. Just not going to happen. Uh, but it is a pretty decent pain reliever for some people, and it's worth a shot because it is relatively safe. So again, for your categories of people who aren't uh, good NSAID candidates, this is a good drug to try because it really doesn't have any of the same criteria of contraindications to NSAIDs. It doesn't have GI bleeding risk. It doesn't have kidney issues associated with it. You can take it in pregnancy. Um, all those good things. Um, and uh, you can use it in, in conjunction with anything else, too. So I'll talk, I guess I can talk about this now. The question comes uh, up sometimes is, can I take acetaminophen with another NSAID? Absolutely. Um, where people get concerned sometimes is if you tell somebody to rotate like uh, Tylenol and ibuprofen, that they might mix them up and end up overdosing themselves on one of the medications. And that's where, um, if you work in, if you go into pediatrics at all, uh, the pediatricians will always recommend using one over the other. You know, as a pharmacist, I'm comfortable with myself if I'm dosing my son for fever that I can remember which one I gave him. Um, and I think you guys probably mostly, most likely, would be in the same boat as that. But there's a lot of people out there that might mix up the bottles. They're both like oral liquids, and if they accidentally doubled up the dose of Tylenol or gave them extra ibuprofen, it's probably not the end of the world, but at the same time, you don't want to be giving your children overdoses. Um, so for the most part, it's, it's just important to remember that the general population might not be able to do a strategy like that, where they're taking things in separate intervals, but you can give them together. You can take Tylenol and ibuprofen at the same time with no issue. So. Um, oh, uh, it comes IV, interestingly enough, and you might be thinking to yourself, why on earth would anyone need IV Tylenol? That's a good question. Um, there is a lot of evidence that's soft, I would say, that says that if you that basically looked at giving people doses of IV Tylenol and comparing them to a placebo group who just got standard of care after surgery or, you know, obstet obstetrics looked at this quite a bit, like post cesarean section, and they showed that the people that got um, IV Tylenol used less narcotics. Interesting thing was they didn't compare that to an oral Tylenol group. They just compared it to nothing or IV Tylenol. And IV Tylenol costs about 100 bucks a dose, whereas oral Tylenol is essentially free. Um, so when, <laughs> when it comes down to it, it's a product that as pharmacists we despise with passion. Like we hate IV Tylenol. And we have a lot of policies in our hospital that let us basically when people order it say, nope, sorry, we're getting rid of that, and then you'll basically have to fight your pharmacist to get it put back on. Um, so I, I don't think this has a lot of roles outside of people who are non-tolerant of oral medications. Then, great, use it. Uh, but for people who can tolerate it, please use oral Tylenol. Don't use IV Tylenol. Again, it's just a waste of money, I think. And the studies don't support it versus oral medications. <laughs> All right, so um, again, Tylenol can be combined with a lot of things. Another problem we get is with the combination over-the-counter cough and cold medications. You have tons of them on the market. There's you know a million different brandings of Tylenol products. There's Tylenol PMs, Tylenol cold and sinus, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all the generic versions of those, too. Um, ibuprofen is just as bad. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and then you have the opioid pain killer, killers that are combo products like Norco and Percocet. I have an opioid plus Tylenol. Um, you don't have any real drug interactions, except when you take it too much, it can have some liver impact. And that's where the big toxicity comes in with Tylenol. Well, Tylenol always makes the list of drugs that people overdose on and the deadliest drugs in the world, even though it's not really a deadly drug. It just happens to be if you if you take a ton of it. So um, it is hepatotoxic in high doses. Remember that four gram a day maximum. You have a little bit of a wiggle room there. So if you go up to like 
Seven grams in one day is usually considered the maximum dose when you're looking at toxicity. And um, there's a lot of tests we can do to look at levels and, and, and how we treat this. I'm not going to get into that now. We're going to talk about this in a lot of detail during tox in the summer. Because uh, Tylenol overdoses are really common because it is one of the most common medications in the world. And again, with all these over-the-counter products and preparations and narcotic combinations, it can make toxicology and overdoses really interesting from a clinical perspective because you don't necessarily know what you're looking for. And Tylenol always could possibly come in and play a role. So uh, again, a lot of people might intentionally overdose themselves on Tylenol um, as a suicide attempt, but some people may just accidentally do it too. Again, they might not realize what they're doing until it's too late. And it is hepatotoxic, and we'll talk about that mechanism uh, during tox, yeah. Okay. Was that your question? Well, sort of. Like, ba basic, I mean, basically, it, it, it uses up a liver enzyme, and it shunts um, the processing of Tylenol to a different pathway, which creates a hepatotoxic intermediate that slowly kills liver cells. Okay. Is that something that, like, someone's going to die? If they take no, a usually not. Death, usually it's right? kind of a slow, nasty yeah. death. Yep. Uh-huh. Yep. It's not an acute death. Yeah, it's really a terrible, I mean, if we're going to talk morbidity here, why not? It's probably one of the worst drugs I could think of to try and kill yourself with. Because, it, yeah, you're going to put yourself in liver failure and end up on a transplant list for years, you know, or, you know, die in, in, over a year. It's not, not a good situation to be in. Um, all right, so I, ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is the most commonly used inside because it's been over the counter for such a long time. Advil, Motrin, or brand names. Um, and we have a similar situation here where you have all the over-the-counter combination products, Advil, cold sinus, Advil, flu, etc. Um, dosing is uh, 200 to 800 milligrams, Q6 hours. Maximum for acute pain is 3.2 grams per day. If you take this chronically, they recommend the maximum around 2.4 grams. So for people with osteoarthritis, maybe taking it chronically, decrease the dose a little bit. That's just one less um, 800 per day. <clears throat> Uh, OTC tablets are all 200 milligrams, so if you're talking to a patient, they say, take a bunch of Advil, well, what's a bunch? Is that, you know, two tablets a day? Is it over the counter? Is it a prescription? And then prescription, you can get 400, 600, and 800 milligrams. So there's not really a reason to prescribe um, ibuprofen to people in the sense of, like, actually writing them a physical prescription. You can tell them to take it and prescribe it that way, uh, but uh, I just would take the over-the-counter product. You don't really get any benefit giving somebody an 800 milligram dose and they have to go and buy it from the pharmacy and you know fill it with their insurance you know it's it's maybe slightly more convenient they don't have to take four pills they can take one but i don't know i'd rather take four little advils than one of those giant 800 ibuprofens personally uh, again lowest gi bleeding risk um but uh, when you're looking at the the risk overall with patients this is such a common medication and so many people take a lot of it over chronic periods of time that Incidence-wise, it is a higher incidence that you see uh, with GI bleeding, but um, statistically, it is a lower risk product. Uh, minimal other side effects, really, uh, other than the stuff we've already talked about, and uh, better pain control with acetaminophen. In fact, better pain control than a lot of things. A lot of places that studies that have looked at pain across a lot of different spectrums generally find ibuprofen to be a pretty successful agent, and most people get a decent response from it. Now, there's some pain syndromes that won't touch, but for a lot of standard stuff, that's pretty good. Uh, naproxen or Aleve, the other really common NSAID, is uh, pretty much, I consider them essentially interchangeable with ibuprofen. The big difference with Aleve or uh, uh, Naproxen is that it is longer acting. So it's a twice daily dose medication. So for people who want something that it's going to take, uh, you know, not going to have to take regularly, uh, it's a good option for somebody to try. Um, again, really similar to ibuprofen. There's uh, over the counter strikes and RX strikes in, in that fashion. Yeah. Oh, Ibuprofen and naproxen. Is it like opioids where some people become like resistant to the? No, usually not. Really yep. Yeah, the question was, do people get resistance or like a tolerance level to it? And usually not. So over time, they won't have to take more. Um, over time, their pain might progress to a point where the it's not really working anymore. But it's a different mechanism. So that it's possible they might not get the same effect from it, but it's not the same as what you, because with opioids, you could give more and theoretically get more effect from it. With these, you can't do that. Yeah. Well, I was just curious, like, people always say, like, a lead works much better than your Advil works much better. Why, why is it such a difference from person to person? The question is personal variability between different NSAIDs, and 
Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's mostly people. I, I don't want to say it's in people's heads, but I think it is. <laughs> I mean, if if you look at studies, they they don't support that. So that's all I can really answer from the literature out there. Um, you know, and I have no problem with somebody saying that ibuprofen works better than Aleve for them. That's if that works better for you, great, take that. I I don't really care. They're the same medication in my mind. Uh, one just lasts a little bit longer. So it may be the longer acting that that does it, or maybe. Some people will say that ibuprofen, because it is shorter acting, it might absorb quicker, so you get a more bigger C max earlier on, whereas naproxen might have a more steady delivery. That could impact it too, potentially. You know, it's hard to say, but yeah, I, I hear that all the time too. Yeah. How about um, liquid gel versus tab? Kind of that? Yes, uh, liquid versus tablets. Uh, basically, they both have to go through the GI tract, and theoretically, the liquid gels or a liquid product is going to absorb quicker because your stomach doesn't have to break down the physical tablet. So you might get, what, 10 minutes of, of impact from it. It's not substantial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? Do people with a low level of chronic pain, is there any reason why it would be bad to be taking like, one of these every day for life? Not really. The question is, can you take these chronically? And yeah, you can. Again, you just have to watch out for those side effects, you know, kidney issues, GI bleeding. As long as that, yeah, you can be elderly and take these, and mm -hmm. it's relatively safe. Yeah. So obviously you can OD on Tylenol, but is there any other NSAIDs that could happen to you? Mm, as, you as far as overdose, the only way you'd kill yourself with an NSAID is you took enough to give yourself a GI bleed and hemorrhaged out. That'd be the way to do it. And I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> So we're, we're, we're getting more morbid here. Um, but the, the point in my comment there, which was not very well, uh, not a very tactical <laughs> comment, I'll admit that. But the, the point is that you, you, don't, you can't really predict that. So like you, you could take a whole bottle of ibuprofen and be just fine. Whereas if you took a whole bottle of Tylenol, if all of us in here took a whole bottle of Tylenol and didn't do anything, most of us in here would go into some form of hepatotoxicity. Now some of us might recover, our livers might get out of it but some of us would die. Um, if we all took ibuprofen, I don't know if you, it's just very variable. I don't know what you would say as far as like the rates for, you know, uh, how much you need to take or how, what the incidence would be of a GI bleed. So it's really <laughs> dependent on a lot of things. And some of those risk factors would come into play too. Elderly people, diminished renal function potentially. Yeah. All right. Good questions, guys. Uh, okay, so remember that I'm not going to ask you any questions about like what categories these fall into because I really don't care. I'm just breaking it down for the sake of breaking it down, I guess. Uh, so there's a group of uh, NSAIDs called acetic acids, and uh, I've got two bolded because I'm not going to test you on the rest of them. Um, we'll talk about endomethacin again when we talk about OB. We'll come back to that, so don't worry about that right now. Um, and in fact, I might mention that during gout in the gout lecture. So. But anyway, for this, for the purposes of general use, it's very specific in where it's used for. And really, OB and gout are the two major ones. But let's get back up to Ketorolax. So Ketorolax is one of the most commonly used NSAIDs. And this one has a whole slew of controversy associated with it. If you work in emergency medicine or any type of surgery, you're going to be really familiar with Ketorolax because it's an IMID NSAID, and it's thought to be highly potent. Um, so how do you dose it? Well, it's got dosing for IV and IM. It's a little bit different. You give a lower dose for IV. I'm not going to ask you a question on that, just FYI. Um, PO dosing is, is lower. It's like 10 milligrams a day. And there was a long time where they thought that Ketorolac wasn't all that effective orally. It's pretty much the same as ibuprofen. But IV or IM, it got this big boost. Um, however, there is some literature out there and actually a recent group of thought that says that this isn't actually true. Um, there's a couple studies out there that show <coughs> when you compare IM or IV ketorolac to oral ibuprofen, you get the same pain scores and there's no statistical difference between using it. And this is a big practice shift if this ends up taking hold. I think a lot of providers like um, giving people ketorolac because they maybe anecdotally feel like it works better. And I'm not going to argue with that because it has been used for, in that way for such a long period of time. I, I, I can get behind it and I don't like question people. But I'm just saying there is some small studies out there. I'm going to say small, like a couple hundred people max, and some even smaller studies that don't support that. And I've never seen a study that actually did. I don't think there's any literature that does support ketorolac being more effective than like oral ibuprofen for pain. <laughs> Now, you might get, because it is slightly more potent, you might get better anti-inflammatory effects. So maybe if inflammation is your concern, that could be a, a different story. But 
Um, the, the nice thing about Ketorolac is that it's useful for people who are NPO. You can give it to them uh, without using the GI tract, and it is the only NSAID we can do that with. So it's got definitely a huge role in therapy. Just the, the question is, is it really that much better than uh, what we already have? Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of the orthopedic docs I work with who would occasionally do like an intraarticular tortoise. Okay. And, um, what would do the reason? And again, so you get the local inflammatory response, and again, you have the ability to do that because it's already in a uh, sterile solution. You couldn't do that with an, any other NSAID. So um, there's a topical NSAID. We'll talk about diclofenac here in a second, which has kind of a similar mechanism where it absorbs topically, and this would be more to be used locally, and this would be, uh, again, interarticular would be a local effect that way. So uh, I was going to say something about a funny study. There was a study that uh, came up with Ketorolac where they gave, it was kind of interesting. What they did was they gave people, oh, so the, this is it, so the question, now I remember. The question is, um, it, is giving somebody an IM or IV shot a placebo effect in and of itself? Does that make people feel like they got something more potent, something stronger for pain? So they did a cool study. Again, it's really small. It's in the small, like 100, 150 people. And they gave them um, all like some kind of a beverage to drink that had 800 milligrams of oral ibuprofen in it that they didn't know about. So they'd drink this beverage, and they'd sit them down, and they'd give them a placebo tablet that had nothing in it, saying it was ibuprofen, or they'd give them a placebo injection of saline saying it was ketorolac. Uh, no difference in the two groups. So they basically, with that small study, are saying that there is no placebo effect from getting an IM shot because the, the oral people have the same as the injection. So there's that uh, that angle of it, too, is I think why people like Ketorolac, because it's like, well, if you get somebody in your ER and they say, well, I need something stronger for pain, and you really don't want to give them an opioid because you really think they might be either A, seeking drugs, or B, not really in that much pain. Um, that's a reason I think a lot of people would go to Ketorolac, because it is that um, IMIV option, but there is, again, all that controversy around it. So. All right. So uh, diclofenac is an interesting drug. It comes orally, but um, it gets used quite a bit more. I think this one's a good one to just remember as far as um, an option that's non maybe traditional. So when it comes to pain, we tend to just think about certain things, and I think to think outside of the box, to get creative with pain management is important. And this is a creative way to do it. It's basically an NSAID that's topical, and it works um, locally. It absorbs into the areas. So, like if you have osteoarthritis in you know, one of your knees, but not the other one, um, and you have some maybe underlying kidney problems, or maybe you've had a GI bleed to oral NSAIDs in the past, a great product to use. Um, I put this chart on here to show you the difference between using Voltaire and gel um, and oral diclofenac. So you can see the percent systemic, systemic absorption is like one-fifth of what it would be normally. So is there still some risk for GI bleeding and, and kidney issues? Yes, but it's much lower than if you took it orally. And you're delivering all your medication to your site of action, theoretically. So there's a, there's a good role for therapy for, for a drug like this. The problem is for really diffuse pain, like multiple joints, big areas, not going to be as effective, but it is not. And there's a patch that it comes into called Flector. But the Voltaren gel is a, is a really popular product. Are those only prescription? Yes, they are. Yep. The only things that are over the counter are just ibuprofen and naproxen products. Everything else is prescription. Uh, some other non-selective things, we're getting into the weeds of NSAIDs here, however, you do see, you see these prescribed from time to time. They have a little bit of, meloxicam, I think, is a more heavily COX-2 selective, although it does have COX-1 activity. Uh, it's a once daily dose one, so it's got one of the longer half-lives of all the NSAIDs we're talking about, so for compliance, it might be a better option for people who want a once daily uh, choice. And the rest of these I don't really care about, so we're going to skip through them. Um, Celebrex or Celecoxib is a um, pure viable, the only viable pure COX-2 uh, selective inhibitor on the market right now. GI risk is very minimal. Um, however, they do recommend for chronic use you would still use a proton pump inhibitor to suppress, suppress acid production like you would with any NSAID. So that still applies. Um, it's dosed twice daily. doesn't have any effect with platelet. Uh, um, uh, the platelet interference and competition like other NSAIDs do. But the dosing is tricky. So you really have a maximum dose of 200 milligrams per day. Otherwise, you're looking at a huge increase in cardiovascular risk. So for this drug, keep it at 100 milligrams BID. Don't go any higher than that. And then you should uh, avoid it in anyone who's already at high risk for any type of cardiovascular disease or, or has a history of cardiovascular complications. But for people who you're need an NSAID for, you're really at risk 
for GI bleed. I think this is a good drug for a person who might be on like a anticoagulant for VTE, um, who doesn't really have any other risk factors. Maybe they had a PE or a DVT, and um, they're at risk, maybe higher risk for GI bleed because of that. This is maybe a good strategy to do because it's got much lower GI bleeding risk than any other NSO. Yeah. Is this just pain management? Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much just general pain. Um, I see sometimes they use this postoperatively, but I think it, it was originally designed as a more chronic medication, but I do see it used acutely too, so you can do it either way. So is that usually the option for chronic pain management? Any, any of them. So the question was, is chronic pain management option, any of them could be used for chronic pain, really. You can take ibuprofen around the clock, you can take naproxen. I think the, the lower frequency dosed ones tend to lean themselves more to that due to the better adherence, but you could really do anything. I mean, people take ibuprofen chronically all the time. Yeah, there's really no one. It's just a matter of if the person can actually take it, you know, if they're getting an effect from it. Um, sometimes, again, those once daily or twice daily ones, people will say, like my dad, he says he doesn't get any effect from, he tried Celebrex and did get any effect from it, but he gets good effect from ibuprofen. So, again, go figure. There's no science to back that up, but he says it does, so whatever. <laughs> Um, all right, let's take a 10-minute break and we can come back. It's a good stopping point. Any other NSAID questions um, before we go on a break? Quick? All right. So muscle relaxants, I'm going to skim through these really quickly because there's not a ton to say, even though they're, they're probably overly used. Um, muscle relaxants as a category, how I have them set up, are really general. And they basically have, a, there's a ton of different mechanisms, we'll talk about a couple of the different ones, but for the most part you're looking at something that's getting into the central nervous system and causing some sort of decrease in spasticity. Um, some of them are used for short-term relief, other ones we might use for longer-term um, spasticity issues, like people who are post-stroke, who have um, nerve damage, people who have spinal cord injury and having spasticity due to that. Uh, so there's a lot of different um, applications to them. Uh, these drugs are sort of on their own island as far as you can use them with an NSAID, you can use them with Tylenol, you can use them with opioids. They, they don't really have uh, any contraindications with combining them. And um, the problem is, is though, with opioids, they are generally a bit sedating. They tend to be, uh, so that could be a problem with somebody on an opioid because those can be sedating too. And anticholinergic generally. So these medications will usually make people maybe a little constipated, dry them out a bit, uh, those types of side effects. All right, so flexorol or cyclobenzaprine is a really commonly used medication, and I, I've talked to a number of doctors that don't really believe it actually does anything, but um, it is something that uh, theoretically would work to um, decrease um, muscle spasms. So mechanism, we don't really know exactly how it works. There's thought to be um, a variety of uh, alpha and gamma receptors, specifically within the central nervous system, on affecting motor neurons, and maybe some effect on norepinephrine that triggers that, but I mean, that's about as vague as I can I can get. So um, I don't really expect you to know the mechanism of cyclobenzaprine because I don't think anyone really, really knows it. Uh, it's really commonly used as a generic medication. It's not recommended for more than two to three weeks of therapy, so this is a short-term medication. Um, we're going to talk about tricyclic depress antidepressants during the, the psych meds, but um, it is similar in structure to them. And <clears throat> We were just talking about urine drug screens, but urine drug screens have all sorts of false positives. And the reason why this is important is because uh, in an overdose situation, tricyclic antidepressants are highly deadly. Um, cyclobenzaprine aren't, isn't really something we're all that concerned about overdosing, even though the structure is similar. However, it will flag on a urine drug screen. So if somebody's on Flexerol, it doesn't mean that they overdosed on, on tricyclic. So you don't have to like rush to, to get them you know, life support or whatever. Uh, in addition to being an anticholinergic, you might uh, prolong uh, cardiac conduction time a little bit if you take enough of it and cause maybe arrhythmias in an overdose. So it is not quite as deadly, but it's a similar mechanism to the tricyclic. So it isn't something we want people to overdose on, but compared to a standard tricyclic antidepressant, it's a little safer. Um, in general, uh, I looped these into CNS depressants. So there's a couple other ones. That, these are all really similar to Flexerol in the, how they work, the effects people get from them and their interchangeability. Uh, so you have uh, vague mechanisms of action again, and you have two drugs, uh, three drugs here, methylcarbonyl, chrysoprodol, and metaxyl. And um, there's a couple different advantages, like uh, methylcarbonyl comes as an IV product. Um, so for like spine surgery or back surgery, they, they use this a little bit um, uh, as an IV product. Orally, you could use it really anywhere. Um, chrysoprodol, um, I believe SOMA is controlled, like it's a C5 or a C4, but I can't remember for sure. 
Um, it does have the potential for abuse, though. It's got um, some effects more like benzodiazepines, which we're going to talk about during the site. But uh, basically, those are drugs like Xanax and, and Ativan. Uh, so it does maybe have some habit for, uh, forming uh, properties there. Uh, and then there's metaxalone. Basically, I'm not going to ask you a lot about these other than knowing that these are muscle relaxants and can be used for. Uh, basically, I guess the, the area where you might see these used is in, as an adjunct for somebody who's having maybe some sort of reporting, some sort of spasm in association with their pain. Maybe you want to keep them off of an opioid altogether and NSAIDs aren't cutting it for them, so you might try one of these medications. Uh, for back pain related to um, spinal cord issues or like uh, people who have like a slipped disc or something like that, that would be maybe a drug that might come into play for those patients. But for the most part, um, I don't know how, how sold I am with these medications. Uh, these two would be a little bit different. These are our chronic antispasticity agents, so it's xanadine and baclofen. Um, they're both used fairly similarly. Baclofen is probably the, the bit more popular one for chronic um, um, spasticity suppression. Uh, as far as the mechanisms, they're quite different. One is a really acting alpha-2 agonist, so it's kind of similar to like a clonidine type drug, uh, but it works more so um, in a different area of the brain, theoretically, so it has more effects, not necessarily on blood pressure, but more effects on the uh, motor outflow of the central nervous system. You have uh, short-acting medications, both of them are dosed fairly frequently, um, and then as far as anything else I really care about knowing, uh, it's not really all that important. Um, baclofen, interestingly enough, can be given through intrathecal pump, which I'll show you in a second. And then um, you'll see a lot of times benzodiazepines used. So they like the drug diazepam or Valium, as, uh, and we'll talk about Valium in a lot of detail when we talk about psych meds. But um, it's primarily used uh, as the benzodiazepine of choice as a muscle relaxant. So again, if you work in surgery and you do a lot of like spine cases, um, these are medications you'll probably be pretty familiar with, but outside of that, you might not use it all that much. Uh, this is just a baclofen pump. It's just kind of interesting how they how they do this. So it goes into the intrathecal space. It's got an intrathecal catheter, you can see here. Um, this looks really big because this is a kid, uh, but it's not in actuality that big. It's more like this is pretty appropriate. So it's a decent sized pump, um, and it has to get filled with medication every so often. So physicians are, are um, uh, PAs or NPs specifically trained to work in rehabilitative medicine would be familiar with these techniques um, and how to do this. So it's a really nice strategy for people who again have chronic spasticity issues, not as a you know, PRN option. So we're getting a little bit off base here, but I just figured I'd mention it. All right, now, so what everybody's favorite pain medications are the opioids. Yay. <laughs> yeah, free samples. But a big big basket of Dilaudida. Big one. Uh, all right, so uh, the funny thing is, is that people probably in this room, all of us together, based on whatever past medical history we have, probably have enough opioids to kill like most of us in this room. So the, with, the, with the commonly prescribed nature they are. Uh, so anyway, opioids are... Um, super prevalent in modern medicine, so that you can use them really for acute, mild, mild acute pain, to severe chronic pain, and everything in between. Uh, patients respond really differently. Some patients might have really high tolerance, uh, you know, depending on what they, their past might be. Some people might be really sensitive to them. Some people may find that they just make them sleepy and they don't get any effects on them at all. Um, it's really variable. Um, the pharmacokinetics are really different for agents. Yeah. Is codeine Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, codeine is an opioid. Uh, we'll get to codeine. Codeine's kind of a. Codeine's, codeine's not the. Yeah, codeine's not really one we use for pain all that much. Uh, I'll talk about it in a few slides here. Uh, so, anyway, there's a ton of different dosage forms. Um, you can use anything from oral to IV to li oral liquid to, again, anything you can imagine patches. There's even a fentanyl. Um, buccal, a delivery device, I call it a lollipop, I'll show you that here in a second. Um, uh, this is a poppy plant, and the way that they harvest uh, opium, or what they end up synthesizing into heroin, is by going to the bulb of the poppy plant, and they cut it, and then this latexy material comes out, and they go and scrape it off, and that's the basis for producing heroin. Um, we'll talk about drugs of abuse during the psych, and so we'll get a lot more into heroin and uh, some of the more interesting things about it. That's basically the process. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, high potential for abuse, so anyone, everybody knows these, this. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit now, but I'll also touch base on it during the drugs and abuse lecture. Uh, fatal and overdose. Uh, generally, these are pretty safe in pregnancy, though, so while they can, of course, have plenty of side effects to them, they don't generally have fetal harm associated with them. 
All right, uh, so some basic stuff. Analgesia, uh, minimum to significant pain relief as possible. Yeah, just depending on what agent you use. You have some really low potency agents that do probably virtually nothing, like codeine, um, and some really high potency agents that could easily kill somebody if you took a whole bunch of it, like fentanyl. Um, there's no ceiling dose with these medications, so you can really push it. If you work with chronic pain patients, so if you go into oncology, for example, you'll see people on absurd doses of opioids that would you know, easily kill an opioid naive patient very quickly. Um, pain medication is, uh, uh, or the pain management is really um, limited by toxicity. So we can push the dose as high as the patient can tolerate it, but ultimately respiratory depression will occur and that will eventually, that's, that's how people die in opioid overdoses. They take too much, they can't breathe because their respiratory rate slows down so much. Um, and that's the ceiling effect of it. So we have to manage those side effects. Most people get really sedated before they get to that point, so they could hopefully avoid you know, pushing the dose too high. But um, that's really what we're looking at, is how functional can our patients be at the same time by providing analgesia, and what dose is, is the happy medium there. Um, tolerance does develop over time, so you do end up building a tolerance to these medications, which is why chronic pain patients end up on really high doses, because they, they weren't on those doses all the time, of course. They, they worked their way up to that. Um, pain perception is altered, uh, and the response to pain perception is altered. So these drugs aren't doing anything. They're anti-inflammatory like an NSAID. Um, all they're doing is working in the central nervous system to alter how your body's perceiving the pain messages coming in, and they're making it feel like you aren't actually having pain. Uh, sedation, minimal to significant. Uh, again, uh, synergistic. These drugs work really well in combination with a lot of things. You can combine them with, with any of our other drugs we've talked about, Tylenol, and said uh, benzodiazepines, like I was talking about, Valium for muscle spasms. Um, that's a good uh, combination. And um, a lot of the synergy reports, like if you combine an NSAID with an opioid or a benzodiazepine with an opioid, you use less of both medications and you get better overall results. So a lot of times when you combine those two, even though we don't like to stack up drugs on people, this is a case where it, where it can help decrease the opioid burden. And when it comes to pain management, that should always be a primary goal, is to use the least amount of opioid possible for the lowest amount of time possible. And you can get to that goal better with some of these combinations, which is why you know, we see this IV Tylenol used so much in certain areas because there is that data supporting the IV product um, using less opioids. It's kind of hard to argue with that. Some physicians are really, really adamant that that's a good product using those so expensive. Yeah. So if you were prescribing a combination, is it like you take an NSAID and an opioid together, or you would alternate? Uh, you could take, you could do either or, yeah. Together would be fine. Um, and then a lot of them come in combination with acetaminophen, so that would be a two for one. I'll, they don't usually come for, come in combination. I can't think of a product that's an opioid that comes with ibuprofen in it, though, so kind of interesting. Maybe a missed market opportunity there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so receptors, uh, opioid receptors are <laughs> listed as the following, and these are receptors that are just in your brain. Um, your brain produces, uh, or your body produces endorphins and other mediators that interact with these receptors to create pleasurable response and feelings, and um, opioids happen to manipulate these very nicely. So our mu receptors are broken into two categories. There's mu1, which is our analgesia, euphoria, and also causes some, some confusion and dizziness. So what we think of as maybe the hallmark of narcosis or narcotic effects. Mu2 being very similar. Um, I don't think it's, I've never heard of a, a drug that tried to target mu1 alone. I'm guessing it's not really possible or they would have figured out a way to do that. Uh, because mu1, mu1 would give you everything except some of the nasty deathly side effects like respiratory infection like mu2. Uh, kappa effects, analgesia, um, dysphoria, uh, and uh, some other issues too. Dysphoria being the big one. The kappa receptors usually aren't targeted by the drugs we're talking about. The drugs we're looking at mostly are having mu activity, and that's about it. There is a couple of drugs that have some kappa activity, though, and I'll talk about those and why we use them. Uh, and delta we don't really care about, so don't worry about delta. Uh, I've never heard of a drug that works on the delta receptor. Yeah. Question. Um, so, like, when they prescribe, like, a robitussin with codeine, yes. are they trying to depress the respiratory system then? Yes, that's a good question. So, I'm going to talk about cough suppressants, but yes, these, these drugs do have a natural cough suppressant effect, and opioids are probably the only drug that actually works to suppress cough reflux. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's talk about the adverse effects. You can see there's a lot of them. So sedation being the biggest one um, that people are going to experience probably right off the bat. 
Um, altered consciousness, um, altered mental status is pretty common too. Low respiratory rate, again, we talked about that. Um, hemodynamics usually aren't heavily affected, so you might see a transiently a transient decrease in blood pressure or heart rate. You shouldn't see it to the point where you're, you're, you're critically worried about the patient. Um, in fact, if we have patients who have low blood pressure or heart rate that need sedation, opioids usually we don't think of as a, as a problem. We think of maybe some other drugs as issues, which we'll talk about during critical care a little bit later. Um, constipation, um, these drugs constipate significantly. So for people who are doing a lot of opioid, uh, even if it's short term, so even if they're doing like maybe an acute few days of it after surgery, you want to have them on some sort of a bowel uh, regimen too, just to make sure that they're moving things through. And we'll talk about that good stuff during GI, so I'm not going to go into details on that too. Other than that, it's a really important thing to remember about opioids, it's not to forget about somebody's bowel. Uh, urinating difficulty, these are more minor ones we're getting into now. Small pupils is not really a side effect anyone cares about, however it is a diagnostic test you can do, like if somebody comes in, heroin uh, user, or somebody's comes into your clinic and they're out of it, and you're like, okay, your pinpoints are, or your pupils are pinpoint, and I'm suspecting you've been taking some drugs today. Uh, that's a good, easy diagnostic <laughs> test that's really heavily associated with opioid use. So, uh, in comparison, like an uh, uh, anticholinergic overdose would have big pupils, versus it's going to have tight ones. Um, itching and rash. So, a lot of these drugs um, release histamine, and the closer we get to natural products, so like, um, Opium being like you know the, the extract from the poppy plant, uh, and morphine being uh, you know the, probably the most natural of the of the ones we use. Those are going to cause a lot more histamine release. And it's just a subsidiary mechanism that we don't really quite understand. But people do get itchy. It's not an allergy, and it's not really like they're breaking out in hives. It's not anaphylaxis or anything like that. Um, a lot of people will take a, a medication called hydroxyzine, which we talked about a little bit uh, for that. So I think I've got a slide on that somewhere here. Uh, physical dependence, again, a um, huge deal there. And muscular rigidity is not, not that significant, not really seen all that often. Okay. So let's talk about opium. Uh, opium is, again, the, the dried latex from the opium poppy. It's 12% morphine, so that's really where the active ingredient comes from, and then it has a bunch of other stuff in it. Uh, we don't really use it for analgesia anymore at all. Pretty much the only medical application opium has is as a uh, tincture, uh, which comes as like this really thick brown liquid in a jug, and it's consumed for diarrhea. So remember, this is a constipating agent. The opium itself, uh, when you put it into the GI tract, doesn't absorb all that well out of it, so you don't really get a lot of systemic side effects, but you can help slow the um, GI tract down a little bit doing that. So people who have like uh, really bad chronic diarrhea for whatever reason, whether it's irritable bowel or Crohn's or something like that, they might try this. It's kind of an unusual item, but that's really all, all I want to say about it. Um, they have a, another product called Belladonna and Opium Suppositories. Belladonna is a derivative, well, it's what atropine is derived from, so it's an anticholinergic um, plus opium, and they give that rectally as a suppository, and it's because it's close to the urethra, if you're having ureteral spasms, it can help um, decrease that spasm. So painful spasms are treated that way. We actually do use this quite a bit. Yeah. Do these patients like run the risk of dependence? Usually not, because the systemic exposure with either of these drugs is so low. There's still like opium is still a C2 control, just because you could, you know, isolate morphine from it if you got your hands on quite a bit of it and then synthesize it into heroin. But um, oh. uh, that's pretty much it. You can't really abuse. Well, you, I guess if you drink the whole thing, you might get some some effects from it. You probably just end up constipating yourself to do that. <laughs> I don't recommend choosing opium as your drug of abuse. All right, so uh, structures, and every once in a while I like to bring out structures, because why not? Uh, opi <laughs> opioids are all very closely related. You can see they share a very similar ring structure. So um, morphine and codeine being kind of the two uh, more natural ones, and hydrocodone and oxycodone being what we call semi synthetic, I meaning they're synthetic but they're very closely related to the original structure of morphine. We get more further into synthetic opioids like hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, um, has a bunch of extra groups thrown in it, and fentanyl, which doesn't really look anything like the rest of them, but it's enough of a, a mimic of the original structure. It locks really tightly into those receptors and it's super potent. So by making things synthetically, we can actually manipulate the molecules to a point where they work much better than the endogenous, or than the, the naturally available ones like morphine. 
<clears throat> so morphine is a really old drug. Uh, it's still really popular. It's a cheap medication and it's highly effective for pain management. Um, you can see this cough syrup. Uh, technically, morphine, Mrs. Winslow's morphine cough syrup. Um, technically, morphine would work as a cough suppressant, so I guess it's not all that bad, right? <laughs> Giving it to your kid. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's available orally and IV. There's a couple different oral products on the market. There's immediate release tablets and liquid. Um, you know, again, you can use morphine for any type of pain. I'm just pointing out some of the areas I think you see it maybe a little bit more of a niche market for it. So there's a uh, concentrated liquid that, so hospice patients, um, when you get close to death, you end up with a symptom called air hunger, where you're, you're breathing really fast and really shallow. Um, and what morphine can do, it's a bit counterintuitive, is suppress that respiratory drive and actually allow you to slow down your rate so you can breathe deeper and make people a little bit more comfortable. Plus it has that analgesic effect too. Um, so that's used a lot if you work in hospice care and end up doing you know, hospice patients, it's something you'll see used quite frequently. And you could really, use, you could use like oral oxycodone too, but the morphine comes as this really concentrated liquid which they can use under the tongue in really small doses to get that effect very, very nicely. Um, extended release uh, products are available too, so this is more chronic pain patients are going to be taking extended release. And so there's a number of different ones. Um, I'll point out MS Cotton is the brand name. Uh, extended release morphine is probably the cheapest long-acting product on the market. So if you work in pain and you have a patient who's got Medicaid, uh, like Minnesota State Insurance, they might not pay for some of the more fancy extended release products, but they might pay. They probably will pay for MS Cotton because it's cheaper. So for chronic pain, that's going to be the cheapest option to be an uh, effective pain reliever. Um, and it's available IV. It's got a bit slower onset than some other opioids, but generally it's not a huge deal. It's still going to work quite well. Um, and again, we still use morphine a lot. It's not something that we've shied away from because it's old. It still works quite well and it's very cheap. Um, morphine, uh, the other issue to consider with it is it does have active metabolites that accumulate in renal dysfunction patients. So patients who have limited kidney function are going to have a more sustained effect from the morphine because of those active metabolites circulating as they go through the liver that aren't getting cleared as frequently. So for renal failure patients or elderly patients, morphine might not be the best choice just because of those. Because it's going to have more of a sustained effect than it would in a younger patient or a patient with good renal function. All right, hydrocodone and oxycodone are really similar. Essentially, you can consider them interchangeable. So for the longest time, oxycodone uh, products were all C2s and hydrocodone products were all C3s. Uh, recently, this changed. I, I think it was two years ago or a year and a half ago. They changed all hydrocodone products to C2s. The biggest difference from a prescribing perspective, there's a lot of regulation differences, but from a prescribing perspective, for you guys to know, you can call in a prescription to a pharmacy for a C3. You can't call in a prescription for a C2. They have to have a physical hard copy just because of the potential for abuse is considered to be that much higher. It's that much more regulation. So a lot of people were upset about this because they're like, what about my patients who run out of their medication on a Saturday? And then they have to go. They have to go to the ER, or urgent care, and yeah, if they do have pain, that's where they would have to go. If you weren't, you know, going to have a, a clinic that's available to see them over the weekend, because you can't call in a new prescription for them. <clears throat> so maybe ultimately, I think this will decrease the amount we see, but it's still it's a big amount. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. How long does prescription last? Like three months? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, legally, I want to say it's six months for a C two. Until it expired. Um, it's been a while since I worked in all patient. But the, the better question is, is what are you actually prescribing? So like, like, let's say somebody got a 10 count Percocet prescription when they left in urgent care two months ago, and now they're bringing it to my pharmacy, my retail pharmacy. So I would tell them, no thanks, you know, I wouldn't fill that prescription. So there's that kind of um, nuance to it too, where the pharmacists, we have the right to refuse if we think something's inappropriate. And most ERs, if I call them and say, hey, this patient brought this back after two months, can I fill it? They'd probably say, no, they need to come back. And so there's those types of like limits on the prescription too. But like you can write out, when we talk about, we'll talk about ADD, and those are class two um, medications too, like all the Adderalls, Ritalins and stuff. Those, um, sometimes people will write those out and date them. So they'll give them like one for, so what is it, January? They might say, okay, here's your January prescription and your February and your March prescription, and they'll put the dates on them. So those last until a certain time. Um, so it gives the patient a little more flexibility so they don't have to come in all, all the time. Uh, but anyway, these are C2s. And um, oxycodone is thought to be slightly more potent than hydrocodone, but they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, it's not that there's some sort of a, a drug company 
you know, smoke and mirrors trick, which got hydrocodone through to be a C3 versus a C2 to push Vicodin when it was its brand name. Um, Vicodin was the brand name of the hydrocodone combination uh, acetaminophen product for a really long time. And it's what it was is 5 milligrams of hydrocodone with 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. The uh, FDA came out and restricted all um, narcotic com combination products and having a max of 325 milligrams of Tylenol. So therefore, the Vicodin brand name is technically no longer existent. You can still say I'm on Vicodin or I prescribe Vicodin, but you can't actually prescribe Vicodin in its true form. Norco, I'll, I'll, on the other hand, was the brand name of the product that contained 5 milligrams of hydrocodone. It's the same amount of hydrocodone, but slightly less Tylenol at 325 in it. So the Norco products prevail. However, it doesn't really matter because they're all generic anyway. It just matters on what you're calling it. So here patients say I'm on Vicodin. Well, technically you can't be on Vicodin anymore. You have to be on Norco. And there's Lortab, which is a whole bunch of other ones too. But basically the point is that the only combination products of either one of these on the market with Tylenol are 325s. And they used to come in all types of different strengths. Like you would see, seven, I, I think there was even a Vicodin like extra strength product, which was like 750 milligrams of Tylenol in one dose, which is scary to think about. So that's all been, it's been stopped. So at least it's toned down a little bit on the combination product side. Um, what you do have is varying amounts of the uh, narcotic product though. So you might see like a 10 milligram hydrocodone, 325 acetaminophen. So you can vary that amount, you just can't vary the Tylenol. The Tylenol can't go above 325. Is that clear? Um, there is a hydrocodone ER product, which I've never actually seen prescribed. To somebody, it doesn't mean it's not used, but it's called Hysingla, and it's a Q24 hour product. Um, and what these long-acting products have are a formulation within the tablet itself to prevent abuse. So they basically say it's uncrushable by making the matrix of the tablet so firm that if you try to smash it with something, you can't. However, drug addicts and um, people in general, I would say, are creative, and you can figure out ways to get around things like that. So there are solvents that people might dissolve it in. And you know, somebody, unfortunately addiction medicine is, is a challenging thing to treat and it's a challenging disease and it's something that people will get desperate for and if they have access to a product, they might put something nasty in it, inject it into themselves and you know, for the high and end up with a really nasty, you know, caustic burn on their vein or something like that. Um, so, but that's been the, the big push is that all these ER products are these abuse deterrent tablets. So that's what they, they say they are. Can people still just like smoke them? Not? Yeah, you can smoke oxycodones. Yeah, that's so like, that yeah, make sense. exactly. So people get creative. <laughs> <laughs> so the abuse deterrent just basically prevents you from crushing it and shooting it. Yep. Right. Um, so uh, oxycodone is uh, immediate release product. So you, and by the way, you can get oxycodone is a standalone product, a standalone immediate release product without Tylenol. Hydrocodone does not come that way. It only comes as an oral product in combination, as an oral immediate release product in combination with acetaminophen. Whereas oxycodone comes as just regular oxycodone, five milligrams, or Percocet, which is five milligrams oxycodone plus 325. So Percocet is basically like the oral equivalent of oxycodone products. And you can have the same thing where you can increase that dose. You can have like a 10 milligram or 7.5 of oxycodone plus always your 325 of acetaminophen. You can't ever go above that. Yes? Um, why would they combine with Apex? Um, originally, I think the theory was it was an abuse deterrent, okay. which is kind of interesting. I think there is a, two, a two-fold thing. It was one abuse deterrent and two a synergy thing. They're like, well, it's a good synergy medication. Oh, okay. Uh, but they thought that, well, if people know that acetaminophen is toxic to take an overdose, they won't take a whole handful of Percocet because that's never happened before, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, abuse deterrents aren't usually the, the best thing to do. Um, so they usually don't work. So what, what's the benefit over this, like over morphine? Well, you have less itching. It's a bit more synthetic. It doesn't have the same histamine response, although you still get a fair amount of itching with these products, at least from what patients are reporting. Um, it's inexpensive. Both of them are quite ex inexpensive. So they're all generic. The Norco products are all generic. The Percocet products are all generic. Um, and the regular oxycodone immediate release 5 milligram product is generic. So it's really quite cheap to prescribe these medications, um, with the exception of the ER products, Oxycontin, and high singla because they oxycontin has a long interesting history that i'm not going to get into a lot but basically it was on the market for a while as oxycontin it went generic and then the fda was like no we have an epidemic on our hands now because everyone's abusing your product um we have to make it you have to go back and reformulate it. so they went back and reformulated it and because of that they got a patent extension 
So OxyContin is still brand name because it's got the specifically designed tablet that is proprietary to that company, which is Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Um, and if you want to go online and read a lot of fun conspiracy theories and hate things about Purdue Pharmaceuticals, there's plenty out there. A lot of people, lot of people think that they are single-handedly responsible for the drug epidemic. It's much more complicated than that. But And these products are really useful for people who have chronic pain. There's no doubting that. So they do have a place in therapy. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, expensive ER products, inexpensive IR. Be really careful with your acetaminophen products if you're prescribing the combo. All right. Hydromorphone or Dilaudid. So this is one of the most effective opioids we have for acute pain management. It's a uh, basically like a morphine, but it's about eight times more potent, and it doesn't have any active metabolites, and it's much more rapid nonsense. So it's really not like morphine, other than the fact that it's opioid. <laughs> I don't know why it's so bad. It's uh, no renal issues, so you don't have active metabolites or renal clearance problems to work with. And I should say that for oxycodone and hydrocodone, you don't have that issue either. So those can go to renal uh, renal insufficiency patients as well. Um, what else? Uh, so this drug comes as a number of dosage forms, and I think I have another slide on this coming up, or at least we'll talk about this in a little more detail. But um, hydrocodone uh, is uh, widely used uh, as probably the IV product, or hydromorphone, excuse me, as the IV product of choice. It's really a common medication to give. And yes, it's very potent, but remember everything, potency all has to do with how much you give. So you can give something really potent, but if you give not very much of it, it might not have as much of an effect. It's kind of the core principle of toxicology, right? So if you give somebody a ton of morphine, that might only be a little bit of Dilaudid. So it's just all about looking at your dose conversions, and I'll show you a good reference for that. Um, I've got it linked in a few slides here. All right, so anyway, there is a long-acting product of this. It's an oral product called Exelgo. Again, it's a Q24 hour extended release. It's an abuse deterrent formulation as well. Um, this product's not really commonly used outpatient. It is available oral as an immediate release tablet, but because of its high potency, it's usually limited to inpatient use because I don't think we generally want hydromorphone circulating in society. I don't, personally. Yeah. Oh, PCA, I'm going to show you that right here. Uh, PCA is a uh, system called patient, patient control analgesia, which is a really nice way that patients can have some control over their pain. And it um, relieves your nursing staff a little bit of having to uh, monitor the patient frequently. And there's tons of locks in place, too. So, so basically, patient control analgesia is going to be a bolus dosing that the patient can deliver on demand. If you hook up a pump, <clears throat> it looks kind of like this next to the bedside. You can see this big, it looks like a big syringe thing. That's basically what it is, big syringe with a pump that um, slowly will deliver medication. These are locked, so the patient can't like get into it and you know shoot up all their stuff into their IV vein, uh, which would be a lot of drug. Um, but uh, there is a lot of settings you can put on these two. So you can lock the patient out of it, so they can only use it every five to ten minutes or whatever you want to set it at. You can put a max dose on it, so if they hit a max dose, it won't give them anymore. And you can run it with a continuous infusion. So you can have it continuously infusing at a certain rate to provide a baseline pain relief, and then the patient can bump themselves on top of that with the button. It's really common. It's used pretty much everywhere. Like OB uses it a lot. Anything post-surgical, in fact, like anywhere is going to use PCA. It's a really um, standard of care. They've shown that patients actually, if they use PCA appropriately, use less opioids overall than if you schedule something and give it regularly, or if you offer people PRNs regularly. Even. All right, fentanyl. Fentanyl is our pure synthetic opioid. It's super potent. Um, when we're talking about other drugs, we're talking in terms of milligrams. and fentanyl, we're talking in terms of micrograms. So like a standard dose of fentanyl might be 50 to 100 micrograms <coughs> of dose. There's a standard dose of morphine would be like 10 milligrams. So that should show you like the potency scale on that. Um, no metabolites, no renal elimination. This is the only one we haven't, we've talked about that doesn't have any oral available dosage form. However, it comes in all of our other favorite dosage forms like IV, transdermal, and buccal. So IV product is really commonly used. It's really fast onset, fast offset. It's highly potent. Um, they actually use it a lot as a continuous infusion for sedation because it's highly potent and they can sedate people and provide analgesia. So it's one of our common medications we use to keep people in a medically induced coma. Uh, but it also works well for pain too in small doses. Um, transdermal, it comes as a patch, I'm going to show you in a second, which is a great option for chronic pain patients uh, who don't want to take oral stuff all the time. Um, and it comes as Acti, which is a brand name for this buccal um, administration method, which I call a lollipop. 
Um, and I think somebody on Google thought it was funny to put a kid's face with the wallet. That is actually the product. This is what it looks like. But yeah, <laughs> I don't think the drug company put this one together. Just... <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, there's no issue with this at all. It shouldn't be. No histamine release. And it's extremely sedating. So again, high potency, high fast onset, really big C max, and really fast C max. It's going to put somebody into sleep pretty quick. Um, and you can give really low doses to keep analgesia without giving that heavy sedation effect. If you want somebody sedated, it's a drug that works very well for that. Chad, is it transdermal do as much sedative properties as your IV? Um, no. So the transdermal, well, yes and no. So it depends on what your dose is. The transdermal comes in a ton of different doses, anywhere from, um, and it's per hour. So like I put a picture of the patch here. So it'll release a certain number of fentanyl micrograms per hour. So for example, like, this is a 75 mic per hour, which is about middle of the road for fentanyl patch. They start at, I think, 12 and a half is the lowest dose. Uh, so that's a really small amount of fentanyl when you think about it. If you gave somebody, like, a fentanyl bolus for acute pain, you're looking at 50 or 200 micrograms for a dose um, all at once. So if you think about the sedation component, yes, somebody's going to feel maybe a little bit sedated on this, but it should be such a steady release that it shouldn't be a substantial sedation. So ideally, if you're on a fentanyl patch for chronic pain, you can function pretty well. Uh, the fentanyl patches last for 72 hours, which is a nice advantage of using them. So um, some tricky things with this, because yes, you don't have to take pills every day and get, you can get chronic opioid release, um, but also you have to remember to take your fentanyl patch off and put a new one on. They're kind of clear. So this picture of this guy with the fentanyl patches, I just put on here so you can see where people can put them. But this is an actual picture of a patch, which is clear. Um, so there definitely have been cases where people have left fentanyl patches on, and while they do run out of medication over time. It's sort of an equilibrium process, and if you leave a bunch of them on, you could overdose yourself. Uh, but you can put it on the chest, back, side, arms. There's multiple places you can stick them, and you can use multiple patches. So well, I'll show you the dosing here in a second, I think, on this next slide. Or maybe not. Um, well, anyway, the dosing, so like, let's say you want it to get in between what the patch comes as. Like, maybe you have a 25 microgram patch, and then the next highest dose is 50, but you want a middle dose, so you give them a 25 and a 12.5 and have them put one on each arm. You can do that. And so fentanyl allows you a lot of different uh, flexibility with that. And it's a good option, I think, for a chronic pain. The problem is with it is that um, the risk for abuse is substantial and it's super toxic. So if you think about um, something that releases a certain amount of, let's say, 100 micrograms of fentanyl per hour for a patch uh, for 72 hours, like how much fentanyl is in there? It's a fair amount, right? So 7,200 milligrams, micrograms of fentanyl. Um, that would kill anyone if they tried to suck on it. Uh, so a kid or, a, or an animal um, will die if they try and try and get this in their mouth and get it absorbed equally, because it won't absorb orally. If you swallow it, I don't know if you're going to be okay or not. You can maybe get somebody to come like <laughs> purge your stomach or do a you know a whole bowel irrigation type of a thing to get it out. Um, but if you sucked on it or like we we're talking about this over break. Like I was reading something online once. I was doing research on patch delivery methods during school, and uh, I read about um, some really sketchy website where people were talking about making it into a tea and how much to use and how much to cut. And um, I, I was looking at this recently, actually, because I was curious. And there are lots of people out there who will abuse these by cutting off small parts of them and sucking on them and getting a high that way. So super dangerous. Um, and for people that have these in their homes, a disposal is key. So they really have to know, and you guys don't have to know how to tell them how to dispose it. I mean, if you're prescribing this a lot, you probably should have a, um, some idea of that. But um, know how to give them the right resources. There are a lot of places that take back drugs that they can send empty medications to. Um, ultimately, you can flush them down the toilet because the FDA um, realizes these are highly dangerous and they don't want them just sitting in somebody's garbage can, so they'd rather have them get into the waste, you know, the, the water system that would then get into the possibly be found by some child to trash can and back. So, you know, there's there's a lot of issues with disposing these, but for the most part, um, you yeah, know, good for chronic pain, but some tricky things to think about. Right now. All right, uh, opioid onset, just to compare things, if you want a visual look at how things uh, absorb and how long they last. We have morphine here, and you can see morphine's got pretty slow peak onset, pretty steady, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Remember, you, you aren't going to get as much of a euphoric effect instantly, and you aren't going to get as much sedation from giving somebody a bump of morphine, but you are going to get analgesia. That's why, again, morphine's quite popular. Compare that to hydromorphone, 
you're getting a very fast onset. Compare that to some of these other drugs here, um, like fentanyl, which is a pink one. Um, some of these other fentanyls, like Remy fentanyl, it's really popular for, um, uh, we use it a lot in some of our, well, not a lot, but sometimes in our procedural areas, our anesthesiologists like it. It's a really fast onset opioid that uh, they can control and titrate nicely. But you can see its kinetic profile compared to fentanyl for procedural. Um, they, they do like it a little bit. It's really expensive, though. Uh, so that's just where these other fentanyls come into play. And uh, the only one I've ever seen used out of these ones is Remy fentanyl. I haven't seen the other ones actually used. Uh, when you, if you do any like uh, research into this or ever read about it, there are super fentanyls that exist, just as kind of a fun side note, that are like thousands and thousands of times more potent. And there's fact, some of these that exist that they're like used for you know large animal medicine, like elephant tranquilizers, that if you touch them with your skin, it can be enough to absorb transdermally that you can kill yourself just by touching a little bit of it. So tons of precautions around these, but for sedating a really large animal, you need something that's not, you know, it can be standardly used on humans for the most part, so they're going to use some, some of these type of drugs. Which, yeah, lots of interesting things. I think, um, I can't remember, like, I don't know if anybody watches Dexter or watched Dexter. I watched it for a little bit. But I think the drug that he used was, I can't remember what he said out, but I believe it's some sort of a, a high potency fentanyl. It's okay. Okay. All right, meparidine. Uh, not going to spend much time on this. No role in pain management. The only thing we use meparidine for is for rigors. So if people are having um, shivering for some reason, and sometimes this happens post-procedural. When people are coming out of, they've been paralyzed during a procedure, they can have pretty significant rigors afterwards. And we can give meparidine at really low doses. <clears throat> meparidine or Demerol was a really popular pain med for a long time. Um, it's an IV medication only. It's got this toxic metabolite called normaparidine that if you give enough of it, it can cause seizures and other nasty CNS side effects. And it's renally eliminated, so it accumulates in people with renal dysfunction in elderly patients. Um, it's got a bunch of other problems you can see there, too. The point is, is that we use this in a really low dose, uh, and we can give it only for rigors. And then you basically avoid all those side effects because you aren't giving enough of it to really matter. But it works really well to, to keep somebody from shivering uncontrollably, especially like postoperatively. Um, if we do therapeutic hypothermia for somebody who's post cardiac arrest, they'll give these two of them to give them bumps of norepiridine because we cool them, uh, and so they're going to be shivering, and so we can help with that that way. So, again, that's only used for norepiridine. You should never use norepiridine for pain management. Methadone. Uh, methadone is the longest half life for any of our non extended release opioids. It's got about, a, got about a 24 hour half life. It's got some interesting kinetics because. Um, if you use it acutely, you actually get a pretty short duration of action. You might get like eight hours of duration, but the longer you give somebody methadone, um, it tends to be uh, increased out over time. I don't know if it's because of its distribution, if it accumulates in certain areas or what. That's just what we see. So in the short term, it kind of works like you can give methadone orally or IV, and it can work almost well for acute pain. If we want to go back to our this other one, here, you can see methadone's on here. You can see it's um, where's my mouse? See, it's onset duration, pretty similar actually to hydromorphone. Not all that different. Um, so for a drug, it's kind of got some interesting properties. We tend to use methadone for a couple specific indications, and one of those is for maintaining people um, who are recovering opioid addicts or for opioid dependence. So methadone has some interesting um, side mechanism. So not only is it a mu agonist, but it's got this really um, slow sustained response. It doesn't really cause euphoria as much as other opioids do. And it also has um, what we call NMDA antagonism, which is something I'm going to talk about when I talk about ketamine. I can't remember where I talk about ketamine, but I know it's somewhere in these lectures. Um, ketamine is an interesting drug. It's an NMDA antagonist. And basically what it creates is a dissociative complex between your brain's perception of how it's sending messages out to your spinal cord, which is in turn can create, um, a, a, I guess, um, what am I trying to say, uh, a distinct like separation between how you're perceiving pain. So it's a different method of altering your perception of pain that's not an opioid. Uh, but this drug has some properties like that too. Um, so it works a little bit differently than a standard opioid. It also is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor which is what a lot of antidepressants work as, too. And a lot of our drugs that we're using to treat neuropathic pain actually have that mechanism, too. So drugs like these would be, um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but Venlafaxine or Effexor, 
angiloxetine or Cymbalta are both SNRIs, and those um, are really popular not only as antidepressants, which is what they're developed for, but as neuropathic pain medication. So methadone, um, not only does it have a number of uh, uh, properties to help it work to keep people off of opioids and help create opioid dependence, because it provides that mu um, agonism like they're craving, but doesn't give them the euphoria, and it prevents people from going into withdrawal. Uh, ultimately, um, the idea is that if you have somebody who's been on addicted to opioids, get them on a methadone program, you give them a daily dose of methadone, and you can slowly taper them off until they're done. Some people might never get off methadone. It's not uncommon to have people on methadone basically for life because for whatever reason during their addiction or they, they just have such a high propensity for addiction that they can't um, do well without it. Uh, methadone has some other caveats to it too. So we talked about the, the general problem with opioids being respiratory depression. This drug also prolongs QTC interval, um, which isn't a big deal in normal dosing. However, if somebody overdoses on methadone, it's really nasty. I've seen a couple methadone overdoses and both people have died from cardiac arrest because you can't reverse it. You can reverse other opioids really easily with a drug called naloxone, which I've got here in a second. Um, this drug, if it's hit the heart and the heart's in an arrhythmia, that's pretty much game over at that point. You can't reverse that one anyway. Uh, methadone is okay in pregnancy, so if you had a pregnant patient who had opioid uh, abuse history, you could use methadone there. Um, Back to pain management a little bit, though. I put not a great option for acute pain management, or is it, with a question mark, to confuse you purposefully. Now, the point of that is that we don't use this for acute pain management, but there's a lot of evidence and maybe some school of thought out there that says maybe we should be using this more. It's cheap, it's long-acting, it doesn't cause a lot of euphoria, and it's pretty effective meditation. Um, and, and you can see there, it comes IV, we can give it IV, we can get a pretty fast onset with it. And uh, it's something that I think people forget about a little bit. It's also a really long-acting medication that could be used for chronic pain as well. So methadone's got some interesting roles. I just don't think you see it used. Providers and prescribers tend to get scared of it, I think, because it's got this stipulation around opioid dependence. And you have to be really, you have to be specifically registered to be able to prescribe methadone for that reason. If you're prescribing it for pain, it doesn't matter. Pain's a different indication. If you're prescribing it for opioid dependence, you have to have a specific DEA member. Um, would you give this to like an infant or newborn? For yes. A... Yes. So if you have a patient, a baby who's been born, the uh, question was, would you give this to an infant or newborn? Yes. If you have a baby who's born who's addicted to um, opioids because the mother was, then yes, they get on methadone weaning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I used to work in a compounding pharmacy where we prepared all these little tiny methadone doses for babies. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, yeah, it's definitely a sad situation, but it does work uh, as far as we know. Okay. Dose conversion. Um, I've got a chart here to show you, but let's go to, whoops. Uh, I'm just going to, let's go to this website quick. This website sounds sketchy because it's like, what, opioidconverter.com or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this website, and I, the first time I found this, I was like, wow, this is too good to be true. It's not. It's actually good. Um, it, it does match up current literature on what the, the conversions are. So opioid converting is really important, um, especially if you are going to be doing uh, any type of pain management that's looking at converting people from one dose to the other. So like if you have somebody who is inpatient on a lot of IV and you want to convert them to an oral program, you have to know how much they've been getting and be able to convert that appropriately. Or you could risk over or underdosing your patient. Okay, so you can calculate a starting dose. We don't want to do that. Let's do a conversion. Um, you've got this disclaimer saying you aren't going to actually use this for clinical use or you're going to, you know, if you kill somebody, you aren't going to see this website. Um, so you can select whatever you want. Let's say you've got somebody on IV hydromorphone and they've been getting, I don't know, five milligrams a day. And you could put other things too. So if they're on some orals already, you could put them, maybe they're getting some oral hydrocodone as well. You could put that in there. And you want to convert it to oral, let's put them on an oral oxycodone. And cross tolerance is something that we'll talk about with chronic pain. I think I've got some some stuff on that either in the remainder of these slides or the next lecture, uh, but we'll get there. Um, cross tolerance is something that happens with opioids, and you want to. It basically means that when you switch from one to the other, you get some added effect from that one just for switching. So you don't have to do exactly at the same dose. You want to decrease your dose totally. So say let's say uh, modify for incomplete tolerance. Yes. Actually, let's not do that. Let's just do a standard dose. It's kind of confusing. I'll show you a calculation on this. So basically, um, here's your equivalent to oral oxycodone. So I did IV hydromorphone, which again is quite potent, and then you have 
your oral oxycodone equivalent. So if you had somebody using that much IV a day, that's about what you'd be looking at. So it's really a high amount of oxycodone. Okay, so this calculator is, I think, really nice to just keep in your back pocket for uh, that specific use. Okay, so and then this chart. Um, so I'll tell you now, I'm not going to make you memorize this. However, on the next exam, there are two questions that require you to be able to convert opioid doses. Um, I've got a few practice problems, and the nice thing is, is that um, there's three practice problems, and two of them, and I'm not going to tell you which two, so you have to do all three of them, uh, will be very, very similar to what's on the exam. So if you go through the practice problems that I'm going to give you, and you go through the keys that I'm going to post, you should be just fine for your exam. Um, I'll let you bring calculators or do whatever. But I do think this is an important enough thing that I want people to be at least somewhat familiar with how to do this. Um, and so I, I'm going to test you on it. Now, what else is there? Uh, fentanyl patches are a little bit different, where there's a whole different thing about fentanyl patches. So basically, you've got to figure out how much morphine per day somebody's on, and then it tells you which fentanyl patch to do. And that's per um, the manufacturer recommendation. So they're a little bit different, uh, but the, the other doses is. Um, on the other slide. So again, I'll give you a bunch of examples of these so you can get comfortable with it. All right, uh, let's get, get through a couple more of these quick, uh, try and finish opioids up at least. Uh, Tepentadol or Nucinta, uh, I don't know why I have a whole slide on this drug. It's not really all that important. It's not used a lot. It's a newer drug that's kind of like tramadol, which we'll talk about in a second. It's immediate and extended release. It's a mu agonist, plus it has inhibition of norepinephrine reuptake, so again, kind of like an antidepressant effect. Um, what it's marketed as is a more tolerable option for patients with severe constipation from opioids. So that's what it's supposed to be a, a replacement for. I don't think it's really taken off a lot. It's a newer drug. It's quite expensive. Yeah, the lion. Yeah, the lion. The, the advertisement's fun. I guess the lion's your constipation and you're calling it by giving it a rose. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so buprenorphine uh, is a kind of an interesting drug. It's a partial agonist. It elicits, it doesn't elicit your full opioid effects, but it does have competitive antagonism with opioids. So where we use this, actually you can use this for moderate pain, and you see this prescribed for pain occasionally. More commonly, this is an alternative to methadone for opioid dependence. And they combine it with naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist, which is on a slide here in a second, which is um, given sublingually. And so that's given as a partial effects enough to give you that mu agonism, um, but not enough to give you euphoria. And the nice thing about buprenorphine that methadone doesn't quite do as well is it competes very well with, so if you inject heroin while you're on buprenorphine, you get direct competition for that heroin on the binding sites. Um, naloxone is combined with, with um, buprenorphine as the product suboxone. And that's so that if you crush it up and inject it, you aren't, you're injecting naloxone at the same time. So you're basically giving yourself the antagonist to your agonist product. So you can't really abuse it very well at all. It's virtually unabusable, non-abusable non because of that point out if it's a word or not. Uh, okay, that's probably a good enough place to stop. I think we've gotten through most of the drugs. I missed a few, but um, I will message you guys sometime this week and either like.